All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Eric South, and the husband of the beautiful Ashley South, and she asked if I would come on here and kind of give some basics about nutrition and fitness. And so a couple of disclaimers, I am not a doctor. Uh, I'm not a personal trainer. But what I do have is about 30 years of experience of avidly chasing this topic. Um, I constantly consume information regarding these two topics, and it's just been a lifelong hobby for me. Every kind of eating protocol I have tried, uh, keto, uh, high carb, low fat, everything in between, I have tried just about every modality of fitness there is. Uh, I had a running phase. I had a bodybuilding phase. I had an MMA phase. I had a kettlebell phase. I had a swimming phase. I had a running phase. And so a lot of the information I'm going to give you today is stuff that I have found that worked best for me and seemed to be uh, the most consistent to work because there's always next month, there will be a new latest and greatest fad. If they, they come, they go. So the stuff that I'm going to share with you today is the stuff that has just tried and true has always, always worked for me. Uh, so when you think about fitness and health on a whole, I want you to think of like a triangle. There is nutrition, physical fitness, and sleep. You need all three. Uh, if your training is through the roof, but your nutrition and your sleep is poor, you're just, you're spinning your wheels and you can interchange that triangle any which way you want. Uh, if your sleep is great, but you're not working out or eating well, you're, you're not helping yourself at all. Um, the other thing is that when we cover some of this stuff, understand that when you, when you look online and you go to the YouTube and, and you are researching some of these things, there's almost a dogma to a lot of them where they will say, hey, you have to eat this way or you're never going to get anywhere or you have to do this particular uh, workout programming or you're never going to, that is incorrect. So there are some things that are optimal uh, for building muscle and, and with cardio and there's others, there's all these nuanced things, but a perfect program that you never do is not going to get you anywhere. So you, some of the things that I'll recommend it will be like weight training. Well, if you say, Eric, I just want to fucking dance, then dance. Whatever it is that works best for you that you enjoy doing is the right answer because that's consistency always wins. Consistency is key. So if you don't like swimming, it doesn't do me any good to suggest you swim 800 meters a day because you're just ultimately you're not going to do it you won't stick with it so when I talk about some of these things these are not the only answers these are just suggestions and we can work around what you're trying to do now with nutrition in particular and I don't really like the word dieting because a, a diet the word diet all all I guess, lends itself to something that's going to begin and something that's going to end. So you're going to start a diet and you're going to go till you hit a certain place and then you're going to stop a diet. There's no, again, kiss, consistency is what wins all the time. So what we want to do is we want to build these non-restrictive habits with the highest possibility of compliance that you'll stick to. So one of the things that people do is they go, okay, Monday, Monday's the day. Monday, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to start taking my vitamins and saying my prayers and Hulkamania, and I'm going to do this. And Monday comes and they, and they, they come out of the gate swinging and they, you know, they go for a run in the morning. They try to go to the gym in the afternoon. They, they radically change the way they eat. All of this stuff lends itself to fit. You are setting yourself up for failure because you've tried to change too much too fast. And what happens is, is they decide that they're going to do this. So they wake up in the morning, 
They have a thimble of yogurt for breakfast. They have nothing but leafy greens for lunch and then a relatively small dinner. And then they've tried to introduce upping their output for the day. Well, their body just goes into shock. It, by, by the third day, they are out of energy. They're out of gas. And they tell themselves that they, they weren't mentally strong enough, that they didn't have the discipline, that they couldn't stick with it. That is incorrect. What happened was, is you drastically cut your calories and then asked your body to do more. Your brain and you knew what you were doing, but your body was like, holy shit, it's the potato famine. We have run into a potato famine and it just stops giving you energy. It starts to hold on to resources and stops freeing them for you to use. The other thing I wanna talk about is when people talk about losing weight, they think cardio. That's just the first thing their brain goes to is I need to up my cardio. Cardio will help you lose weight only in the fact that it's added calorie expenditure. What cardio actually builds is work capacity, your lungs, your heart, so weight training changes body composition, the way you look, the amount of muscle you carry around. Food is how we're going to control uh, body weight and body fat percentage. With that, everybody tends to, one of, the, one of the common mistakes is people tend to focus on the number on the scale, what they weigh. We shouldn't worry so much about losing weight as we want to lose body fat percentage. If I could take 10 pounds of body fat off of you and put 10 pounds of muscle on you in the exact same instant, you would feel and look fantastic. So it wasn't the number on the scale, it's the body fat that we really wanna kind of go after. With uh, one of the recent uh, peptides that's gotten really popular is the semaglutide. And it, it, is a, it is a weight loss supplement. And a lot of people are using it and it's, and it's having a, a pretty good amount of success. But what people aren't doing is, so when you look into the studies of semaglutide, 35% of the weight those people lost was lean muscle mass and connective tissue. That is no good. Now you can run semaglutide safely, but you have to understand your intake. So you have to up your proteins, you have to up your calories, which is hard because the way semaglutide works is it just makes it to where you're just not hungry. You don't want to eat. So, um, but again, we're like, we just wanna, we wanna focus on fat loss, not weight loss. And the way that originally when Ashley asked me to do this, I, I was like, yeah, that's great, it's easy. Like we can get on here and talk. And I originally I, considered just this huge data dump of all the information and then Ashley and I spoke about it last night and we realized that like hey do we just want to give people the information or do we want people to succeed and so what we've decided to do is I'll do a couple more of these and I'm going to give you all the information you want uh, Ashley printed off some of the questions I'm going to answer those at the end but what we decided to do is I'm going to give you about a month worth of steps, like hey, step one, with just some action items. This is what we're going to do and why we're going to do it. And then through the email chain, I'll be sending out stuff once a week to kind of say, hey, this is what we're going to adjust. These are what we're doing. And you guys can ask questions and send, and we can kind of communicate through there. Because when we try to change too much too fast, the way that this is set up is it's little tiny changes. It's slower, but it has the highest success rate because it's slow. We're changing one, maybe two habits at a time. That's it. And so when you're doing these one, two things at a time, it helps build discipline because discipline is just like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. So if we keep the buy-ins really low, like, hey, you just have to do this one thing. When you repeatedly do that one thing and it becomes a habit, now we add two things. Now we add three things and it stacks on top of each other. And before you know it, you're off to the races and you won't need me for a damn thing. 
So step number one is going to be tracking. For one to two weeks, all you're going to do is track your intake. That's it. And there's a there's two different food track. I well, there's not two. There's a handful. There's a bunch of them. Uh, and this is stuff I'm going to send out in an email with links and, and kind of tutorials on all that stuff. So it'll help you guys out. But one is called My Fitness Pal, and the other one is called Macro Factor. Those are two that I have used and liked a lot. My Fitness Pal is free and wildly intuitive. It is super simple. Uh, it's got a little uh, bar scan photo thing. It, it'll track all your food for you. It's, it's very easy to use. The macro factor is not as intuitive, but it's much smarter. Uh, the, the AI, the software that they use is really, really good, but it's just not as, as intuitive as the MyFitnessPal. But with the, uh, with the tracking, we're gonna focus on four main metrics. Our total, total calorie intake, our proteins, our carbs, and our fats. That's it. We're not worried about the sodium. We're not worried about the sugars. We're not worried about any of that. Those are the only four that we're gonna look at. But for that first one to two weeks, don't change anything. Just eat what you eat. However you do it, like if you only eat one meal a day, eat one meal a day. Any, of, any and all foods are welcome. Like you don't have to try and cut your calories. I don't want you to, oh, I shouldn't eat this cake because I'm tracking my food. Nope. If you normally have a little Ben and Jerry's, have some Ben and Jerry's. Just keep everything the same. The only thing I want you to focus on is tracking your food. So we're going to do that for about two weeks. And then after that two weeks of just tracking, we're going to hit step two. And after that, we're going to slowly start to swap out some of the foods you eat for higher quality food choices. Uh, some of the more nutrient dense kind of best bang for your buck foods. They, uh, with like your proteins, we're gonna look at like lean meats, lean dairy products, uh, high quality vegan sources, if that's your thing. For carbs, we're gonna look for fruits, veggies, whole grains. And for our fats, we're going to lean towards the monosaturated fats, like the olive oils, the nuts, the nut butters, avocados. But we're going to make <clears throat> really small changes. And we're going to get rid of some of the, the worst stuff first. So if, you know, if there's eight Twinkies in your daily consumption, we're going, to, we're going to swap that out for something a little better. But we're not going to drastically change your diet. We're just going to make small substitutions. And then we're going to do that for two weeks. And this is going to help with finding, because some of it is food choice. Like I can tell you to eat chicken breast all day. Hey, okay? from here on out, you can only have chicken breast, brown rice, and broccoli. Well, I personally, I don't like chicken at all. Like I can eat it, but I don't particularly care for it. So we need to make foods that are palatable to you. And only you know the answer to that but we can give you some suggestions and point you in the right directions for things that are, for these, for these swaps that are suitable for you and that you'll actually eat. And then step three, we're gonna start getting into, uh, after we swap your foods for two weeks, that'll give us one month in. Now in that month, most likely you're already going to start to see some, some weight drop because when we start removing some of the bad and introducing some of the good whole foods tend to satiate you faster uh an example i'll use is just from us the other night uh ashley and i we ordered pizza for the kids and her and i both dove in and then we about an hour later we both regretted it with these highly uh high high sugar foods with high palatability you can eat a ton of it if I took the weight that I ate in pizza and tried to eat it in a lean turkey breast, I, I'd, I'd never come close. Like I would get full and my body would say, stop, like I'm done. Same with like an orange juice. If I was to sit down and I can pound 12 ounces of orange juice, but if I had to sit down and eat what was comparable 
in oranges, I would never make it. My body would go, stop what you're doing immediately. So when we do these food swaps, you'll start to see weight drop anyway, and it'll be the good weight with fat loss. Uh, and then on that third step, we're gonna rearrange some of your macros. Uh, macros is short for macronutrients, and they are the essential components of our diet that provide energy and are needed in relatively large amounts. Uh, there are three main ones, and that's proteins, carbs, and fats. When we adjust your macros, protein is gonna be our number one target. And then with that, we're gonna aim for about, and this is to help keep things easy, we're gonna aim for about one gram of protein per pound of body weight a day. So me, I weigh 235 pounds. My target is 235 grams of protein in a day. Fats is our next one. One of, and I wanna say it was in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, where that low fat dieting fad kind of got really, really popular. That is dangerous. And fats do a lot for your hormones and some of your just essential body functions. So with our fats, we're gonna stick around about 0.5 grams of fat per pound of body weight a day. And all this stuff, like with the math I'm throwing at you, like. In the, in the emails that we're gonna send out and in further videos, like we're, I'm gonna do the math with you, we'll get it sorted. It, it's, it's, it sounds complicated at first, uh, but if I was to write it out for you and show you, you'd go, oh, that's super simple. Uh, and then we got our numbers from our proteins and our fats. Then we're gonna take what's left over in your calories per day, and which you'll get from your tracking, you'll know how many calories per day roughly you average. From that, we're going to take that number, divide it by four, and then that's your carbs. And how we get there is that there are four calories per gram of protein. There are four calories per gram of carb, and there are nine calories per gram of fat. And now in the beginning, our fats and our carbs are gonna be a slight bit interchangeable. Like our fats, we're never gonna go below a 0.3 because that's when you start leaning towards that unhealthy range of uh, fat intake. But if you don't particularly like fats and you lo love carbs, like I, I do better with more carbs, Ashley does better with more fats. It is 100% your body is going to do what it wants to do and your your eating should reflect that if you feel better with higher carb content we can keep that um and then in, in the further emails we're gonna we're gonna figure out how to find because we're gonna get with the tracking we're gonna find out what you're eating there's a high likelihood that you might actually be under eating which sounds counterintuitive to people but when people under eat, what happens is, is like we talked about before, your body just holds on to everything. So your energy levels will plummet. Uh, and you just, you're like, oh man, I'm tired. I don't feel very good. I don't want to work out. I don't want to do this. Like you just struggle throughout the day. But at the same time, you're not losing any weight. Well, it's because your body's holding on to everything you give it because you're not feeding enough. And in the questions that I'm going to get to here in a second, um, there was somebody in there. Let me see here if I can find it. Um, okay, it says, I feel lost, was on a very strict food protocol for years, then tried keto and then low carb, high protein. Uh, I'd like to lose 30 pounds and gain, or at least maintain my muscle. This is a perfect example, uh, with a very strict eating protocol and then switching to keto. And then you probably switched back 
reintroducing carbohydrates. Uh, what can happen with these really strict food protocols, you can accidentally inadvertently just nuke your metabolism. And so it's not running the way it should. And so this is going to be a prime example of somebody who's we're probably going to up her calories quite a bit just to reset her metabolism. So we'll ramp her, we'll ramp her calories up and it'll get her metabolism to start firing because now we're giving her metabolism and her body all the resources it needs. And it will start to free that up as energy. It goes, okay, I no longer need to hold on to this for survival. I can start allowing him or her to use this as energy. And then once we hit that and it's, it's, it's going to sound weird, but like their weight will probably go up and that's okay. <laughs> that is okay. Because what's going to happen is, is we'll get that to plateau. We get that metabolism reset and then we'll start to walk her back down in a slow, healthy, controlled manner to where everything she's losing is, or he is going to be body fat only energy is going to be better. Strength is going to be better. Everything's going to start clicking. Um, and we can actually get into, because those are the three steps that we're going to do for the next month. We're going to start with step number one. And the most important is just start tracking. Uh, there are hundreds of food trackers, apps, and online. You can download the two that I suggested are just ones that I have personally used and liked. You, you can download whichever one you like. Uh, if you like the picture or the little thumbnail for it, get that one. Doesn't really matter. So that's number one. We're not changing our eating. And if you want to pick up your activity level, I would suggest you just even for even for uh, anyone on here that's uh, that's pretty active, just incorporate some walking after meals. So after you have breakfast, a little fifteen minute walk. After you have lunch, a little 15 minute walk. After dinner, a little tiny 15 minute walk. And that's it. And then number two, after the first two weeks, uh, step two is gonna be food choices where we start to look at what you're eating and then we'll start swapping them out for some better choices. And then finally, number three, at the tail end of the month, we're gonna start messing with your macros a little tiny bit and start to attempt to hit. And some of this stuff, Close is awesome. We are not looking for perfection. Uh, you, you, the, some of, I'm one of them. If I start something and it's not perfect, I go, okay, I have to start over. Like I just, I gotta start from scratch. This is not perfect. I have to start. This, we don't need to do that here. We just keep trucking right along. And each day we just try to get a little tiny bit better. So that's it for now. I'm going to get to these questions. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to track. We're going to do food choices and rearranging macros in this first month. And uh, Ashley informed me there's a way where I can make little tiny short videos and send them out to you. And if you guys send questions, I can answer them. And so that's what we're going to do. And let's see, question number one, at age 59, are weights and walking enough? Weights and walking are perfect. Um, you can't, do, that's perfect. Because again, weight, weights are gonna help body composition and muscle retention. Uh, walking is, that's calorie expenditure. Uh, cardio is just for work capacity. If you aren't gonna go run a triathlon, there's no need for you to run. Uh, let's see, how do you gain muscle and lose fat? That is exactly what we're going to be doing. That's exactly how we're going to get there is with uh, rearranging our macros and introducing some physical activity. That's why we keep our protein as number one, because the protein is what's going to help repair tissue and build muscle. Um, that's why we put that at the top of our little chart. And that's why uh, our carbs and fats come second and third. Mm, I get overwhelmed with food, what to eat, when to eat, and how to incorporate exercise. Uh, so far, I've focused on what I learned for blood sugar. And I find it's leaving me with a lot of skin. I need to build strength from being inactive for so many years. 
and I have uh, improved just being able to move around, but my strength is far below what it once was. And I'd like to get it back. Okay, it's overwhelmed with food. Food we can keep very simple. Um, there is, you can make this as complicated or as simple as you like. Me, I'm super simple. Uh, most of my meals consist of ground beef and rice because I like it, it's palatable, it's easy to make. I can make it in large quantities and I can set myself up for the week to where all I have to do is reach in the fridge and grab and go. Um, so we can tinker with taking some of the complexity out of that, uh, just with some, we find some things that you like to eat and we can set up, you know, a rotating uh, meal plan. There are, there's different ways to do it. Like every three days you cook up, you know, your lunches for the week or whatever. Um, but yeah, we can make it as complex. If you're a foodie, we can go super complex. Um, me, it just, it's, it's to save time and be efficient. I keep things as simple as possible. As far as the improving strength, I don't know where you are exactly, um, but really just the, the doing of things will, will help. Weights aren't for everybody yet. There's gonna be some of you that, um, you know, when, when it says being inactive for so many years, I don't know exactly what that means, but a good starting point might just be squatting and standing up out of a chair a couple times a day, just to build that leg strength. And, and I'm, you know, that's really kind of at the, at the bottom of the scale, but there's scaling options for everything. It doesn't matter what you're trying to accomplish. We can find something that you can do and build from there. Uh, let's see how to curb sugar cravings. How to curb sugar cravings is difficult uh, because there's when we ingest sugar, there is something inside of our brains that says, ooh, I like that a lot. Uh, and later on, we can really get deep in the weeds on the science behind that. But to curb them, there's only two ways I know of that really work well and one of them uh is when you have those cravings go do something physically active get get outside throw a ball for your dog go for a walk go for a run um and the other one is is to give in to said craving those are the only two i know that work um you can substitute things like we use uh chocolate covered almonds around here uh for that because it gives me a little bit of sugar, but it's also a pretty healthy snack. And it's kind of that middle of the road. Uh, this one says I've hit a plateau and can't seem to get over it no matter the foods I'm changing up with. I've been eating uh, fruit and veggie with very little meat and doing fasting with only eating between 11 and seven. Okay, so meal timing isn't as important as your overall totals. So if you're a person that just does not like to eat breakfast, you can skip breakfast. Uh, however, um, one of the common themes is, is that uh, intermittent fasted cardio burns more fat. And that is a half truth. What happens with fasted cardio is there's, there's two things that happen to burn fat. One is called lipolysis and the other is oxidation. Lipolysis is the mechanism which frees the fat up, puts it into your bloodstream to be used as energy. The oxidation is the actual burning of the fat. With fasted cardio, 100%, there is more lipolysis, but there is no different oxidation. So you freed up more fat into your bloodstream, but if, you know, Fasted cardio, a uh, 45 minute run versus unfasted 45 minute run, you burn the exact same amount of fat. So if you're in that eating window because you believe that your fasted cardio is somehow helping you burn fat, that is incorrect. Um, but if that's, if that's an eating protocol that works best for you, stick with it. Meal timing is not important. Uh, let's see here. With the fruits, veggies, and very little meat, uh, I would argue that you might also be one of the ones that's eating too little. 
Um, and then with the very little meat, I would say your protein's probably super low. And so the, your, any weight that you do lose or don't lose is going to be muscle. Uh, and we can look and there's, there's, a, there's vegan sources for protein, uh, the fermented pea proteins we could probably look into. Uh, let's see here. How do you know how many calories to have per day to maintain your weight? So there is a calculation, which I can give it to you now, but it was supposed to be uh, in our next video. It's step four. But if uh, you have a pen and paper handy, we can give it to you now. So the way you calculate how many, and this is ballpark. So when you get on an exercise machine or your Apple watch tells you how many calories you've burned, that is a very, very broad stroke. The only way to accurately measure uh, calorie expenditure is if you were to go to a university with a lab um, and they look at a lot of different things. Uh, they look at your oxygen level. There's a whole lot that goes into it. So with this, with any kind of calorie tracker, uh, with any sort of exercise equipment that's telling you how many calories you've burned, please understand that that is a very broad generalization. They don't actually know how many calories you're burning, but you're going to fall into one of three groups. So you're either going to be sedentary, moderately active, or very active. So moderate would be you work out three to four times a week. Very active is uh, five to seven times a week. And what you're going to do is, and this was a question to maintain, but I'll give you all three. You're going to take your body weight, whatever that number is. If you're sedentary to lose weight, you'll times that number by 10 or 12. To maintain weight somewhere between 12 to 14. And to gain weight somewhere between 14 and 16. Uh, for moderate active, you're going to times your body weight somewhere between 12 and 14 to maintain 14 and 16 and to gain 18 and 20. And for very active people to lose weight will be your body weight times 14, somewhere between 14 and 16, uh, between 16 and 18, and between 18 and 22. And this, this particular equation we're going to get to in step four. And generally, I always tell people that I, I would like them to lean towards the, the heavier number. And the reason for that is, is it's easier to start with too much. And then we start to watch the trend of your body weight go up and then come down. And the reason that works better is, again, it's a, a, it's a component of that mental piece. If we do this and we go low and we're not giving you enough calories and you're not losing any weight, it becomes frustrating and like, hey, this, this just doesn't work. Where if we put you on the upside and you see your weight go up, you go, oh, oh this does work. It's just working in the wrong direction. And it's easy to go from uh, too much to neck it back down than it is to neck down too much. And then we have to do a couple of steps to build back up. So I'd always go with the higher of the two numbers. Uh, and that's just a good, and again, it's broad. That's a good starting point. Uh, some people will find that they burn more than this is, is suggesting. And some people will find they burn less. So it's just a ballpark figure to get us started there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what are easier ways to consume more proteins without feeling like you've constantly eating or full? Protein can be tough um, and, and hitting those numbers can be difficult. And so one of the things is uh, supplementation, like a protein shake, where it makes it a little bit easier to, to hit those numbers and not feel like you have to eat multiple meals of heavy meat laden foods every day, which, which can be really satiating and you're super full throughout the day. Um, there's, there's a handful of other than a protein supplement. Uh, egg whites is always a good one. Uh, one of the, one of the old, 
old school tricks would bodybuilders would buy those uh, pasteurized egg whites from Costco, the little cartons, they look like a little tiny milk carton. And because they're pasteurized, there's no, you're not gonna get salmonella from it. And they would just throw that into uh, some sort of slushy or drinks. Uh, but I will tell you from personal experience, uh, you take it easy, start real low because there is a threshold of those egg whites before your stomach has revolts. I don't know what it is or why it does that, but there's a threshold in there and everybody's a little different. You drink too much of it and that tea doesn't have shit on that egg whites. It's like, you'll have some problems. Uh, let's see. Uh, I want to figure out how much I should be eating a day. And we're going to get to that in step four that we just talked about. Uh, let's see. Best sources of protein are going to be lean meats, lean dairies. Uh, Clean eating, that's convenient. We'll get to that. Also in step four, I need fitness for riding in a truck 12 hours a day. Fitness for riding in a truck 12 hours a day. Um, I would suggest that a kettlebell is gonna be your best friend. Uh, they're relatively small. They don't take up any room. You could put it in your truck with you. Uh, literally it's, it's really the diameter of a bowl and in about 25 minutes with a kettlebell you can do a whole lot of work uh there is uh, whoever this question was fitness for riding in a truck would you do me a favor would you send your address to the email chain to ashley i i have a book i want to send you um that is all about kettlebells it's it's a it's a really good book the author is Russian and he has a really weird sense of humor and he kind of comes off as corny, but he really knows his stuff and uh, kettlebells can be tricky, but I'll send you this book and then that way you can get a kettlebell and throw it in your truck and you'll be off to the races. Mm, exactly how many times a day should I be eating to help build more muscle? Again, uh, frequency and timing is, is pretty low on the list. A lot of times the frequency is what helps us reach our ultimate numbers because to sit down and in one meal consume all of that is tough. There are people that do it and they can do it. Uh, there's several professional athletes that I can think of off the top of my head that are, the, I think they call it the Spartan diet where they just eat once a day. I, I don't know that I could eat all of my calories in one sitting. So as far as frequency, whatever works best for you, as long as you're hitting those numbers, your total calorie, your fats, your proteins, and your carbs. If, if that equals six meals a day for you, uh, Ashley can't eat big meals. So for her, it's all about super frequency. It's, you know, that five to six meals a day range where as soon as her feet hit the floor, she's eating something. And then it's kind of little tiny meals throughout the day. Um, I can do it three. I have three meals a day and then a couple of snacks in between and, and I hit my numbers. Mm, how to track macros with our little handy dandy trackers. And that one I already answered. That was the strict protocol one. Mm, best proteins are how many grams? So we're, we're going to shoot for one gram of protein per pound of body weight a day. Uh, best nutrition and workouts for pre-menopause to be honest with you that's a little outside of my wheelhouse and I don't actually know the answer to that uh, but I'll look into it I'll find the answer uh, rest day macros versus and calories versus active day macros and calories thoughts on refers day refers day I think you mean refeed days I think and meal timing so uh, rest days, macros and calories versus active days. Absolutely. You can do that for, uh, just by reading this question, I, I'm going to put you in, you're probably one of my, uh, one to one to 10 range athletes. You're probably in the seven to eight range. Um, and let's see thoughts on refeed days. Refeed days are good. If you're being super strict. Uh, calorically throughout the rest of the week. 
um, usually refeed days, you're looking at uh, either a really high output sport, like, uh, like ultra runners, uh, or professional bodybuilders that are looking for an, an exotically lean amount of body fat. And so they're with the, with the bodybuilders, what's happening is, is that they're so calorically restricted on most days that they need that refeed day for their body to kind of reset. And then with the ultra runners and that super high caliber athletes, those refeed days usually come after some sort of grueling event. Um, and again, meal timing is not super important. It's just whatever fits best for your schedule. And then exercises for the stomach. Okay, I think all it says is exercise for the stomach. And I, I, I think I understand the question. There is no targeting of a, of a particular body part. If, unless, unless you want your stomach just to be stronger uh, or have a stronger core, if, if this is something that, if this question is based on appearance, is there's no amount of sit-up. You can do a million sit-ups. You cannot out-train a bad diet. So if, if your calories and your intake is off, you, you're never, you're never going to fix the, you know, if you've got just a little pooch here or a little extra body weight there or little love handles or saddlebags, 100% that is going to be our, our food. Our food controls body weight and body fat percentage. Weights are going to change body composition, the way you look, and cardio is going to build work capacity. As far as targeting a, a specific muscle group, it, it, everything has to work together or it doesn't work at all. And that was it for the questions. Does anybody have anything else? Oh, so what's that? Yeah, what did you say? Oh, yes. Um, one of the other things is, uh, it, and, and it's, a pretty, it's a pretty common phenomenon, uh, particularly with women, uh, if they always want to change something. Uh, like if they have, if they're quad dominant, like they, they just naturally, they just came out of the box with bigger legs they immediately want smaller legs. You can't, you cannot fight what the good Lord gave you. Yeah, like we, we can't do that. So it's much better to lean into your body type, whatever that is. So if you notice that you gain muscle in your legs faster than you would like, I would argue you should try to have the best looking big ass legs there are. Like, cause you, cause you're not going to fix it. Like we can't undo genetics. Like we just, we cannot like it. That's like, if you were born tall, I cannot make you shorter. Like I just can't. So what you do is, is you lean into what you have and build it to the best of your ability. If that makes any sense. And that's about it for this segment. And I, we'll start getting those emails out and some of the videos. And if you guys have more questions, feel free to email them in and I will answer you. And we'll probably, this will probably take, I would imagine maybe two more videos before we get all the information out. Uh, but we're going to do it in these little tiny, easily digestible bite-sized portions. So with some action items, that hopefully everybody can kind of follow along and we're going to try and make it as smooth and as easy as possible. And hopefully we get everybody rolling. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you guys coming and I will talk at you later.